So uh, I first heard you yeah. talk at a we were it was a, a regional conference, East Central Region. I, yeah. I live in Michigan in the United States, and uh, we used to have regional conferences every year. I must admit, uh, they in no small um, no small way because we had a tradition of a vodka luge every night. Uh, they blend together to yeah, me after sure. a while, yeah. so I can't remember if it was Las Vegas or Pebble Beach, but yeah. one of those times you spoke, yeah. and. Um, my forum was, we were, there were several of uh, my forum mates who we talked about all the time that were already using the Rockefeller habits, and you got up and, and sort of started giving the, the story about how you read the book Titan, Titan about yeah. John D. Rockefeller, and uh, that you kind of developed a lot of the core concepts of the Rockefeller habits around studying some of the practices of John D. Rockefeller. Now, I'm a history guy, and I, you know, I love quoting old stuff and you know, taking sort of the wisdom of the ages, but I'm like, holy crap. I mean, everybody's talking about Jack Welch and uh, Nordstrom and Starbucks at the time. No one is talking about John D. Rockefeller. So what, you know, what were some of those core insights yeah. and, and how did that become the building blocks of really what's been your career of coaching yeah. executives to grow their growth companies? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. You guys probably are aware that he's the wealthiest guy in the history uh, next to Putin. Next to Putin, and, yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> that's not even funny anymore. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's the truth. Uh, and, and it's by percentage of GDP is how that uh, calculation was made. And that, that struck me as interesting, that this would be a guy that started out when he was 16, uh, launched the company when he was 20 with his brother and three buddies, and then he scales something this significant. And so it was a good friend of mine, John Anderson's wife, Cindy, who gave me the book Titan when I was visiting there in Detroit just before I went out to Western Michigan. And I was struck by how disciplined uh, he was. And, and the thing that struck me most, which is why it's at the core of what we do today, was that he and his brother and his three buddies would walk to work every day, and then they'd walk home at the end of the day in Cleveland, something you could do easily in the small communities. The thing I miss most about Barcelona is the ability to walk around instead of this car culture that we've got. And he really recognized that that's when all the most important decisions got made. We're on those walks and talks. Walks to work and home. You got it, those few minutes. So when he moved the headquarters to New York, even though his inner circle changed, he consciously made sure that they lived near enough to each other, close enough to Standard Oil headquarters, they can continue to walk to work and walk home, and then he instituted a daily luncheon with his nine directors. Now, I think it's interesting, if you speed forward 100 years later, the guy who did the same thing, Steve Jobs. Steve was famous for his walks and talks. Whenever he needed to get anything sorted out, he'd invite in whatever luminary he thought was needed to mentor him, and they had this route that they would do a walk and talk on. There's a lot we know about walking that energizes the brain, the left and right movement. People do this when they're nervous, it calms them down. And then he had lunch almost every day with Jonathan and I. He understood that design was at the heart of what would be Apple's success, which it is still today. And so it was that set of fundamentals that I saw guys like Steve Jobs, the new young entrepreneur that John D. was, the original, uh, meant that there was something there that we could all learn from. And then there was a whole set of other habits then that we we extracted. Yeah, of course. I always remember you, uh, you know, then followed that on with, you know, if you almost ask any, you know, executive who probably works in a lot of our companies, is yeah. this whole culture of death by meeting and, and yeah. all of that sort of thing. And what you proposed this really radical idea, and I remember you talked about this sort of, uh, even a set of habits that Michael Dell had been using at the time in Dell, right. is that the challenge isn't lots of meetings, the challenge is that they're too long and too unfocused. Yeah. And that, you know, by building your day around this concept of a daily huddle, maybe two, um, and then picking up the pulse and getting people to have more focused, shorter meetings is how you can kind of unleash the organization and yeah. give people time to think. Yeah, yeah. If you want to move faster, you have to pulse faster. And I think what's interesting, there isn't a company in Silicon Valley that would even think to run a moment without a daily huddle. It's at the heart of the whole scrum and agile methodology that creates would basically run in the world right now. Yeah. Um, so you, 
Okay, let's kind of, and we're going to jump around a few topics, but I want to get to this idea of where you think the real economic engine of the world is. Um, you know, you, um, after, uh, you know, in the, your EO days, you taught and ran or created the Birthing of Giants program. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what that means, and, and then we can kind of get into that whole middle market yeah, company idea. So, Well, we just, uh, look. We shamelessly stole everything we've done in YEO from YPO. So let's just get it out there. And so I went next door to MIT. And we figured, look, our bunch, though, we don't have three weeks. We've got to try to get this thing done in three days. And so in 91, uh, launched this program called The Birthing of Giants. And it's been cool. We had some really, really, you know, Ted Leonsis was in that class, uh, went on to help build AOL with Steve Case. Brad Feld was in that, cl that first class, went on to do Tech Stars. And, Fitbit and all that good happy stuff. Uh, Alan Treffler was there with Pegasystems. 19, at 19, he was the co-chess champ of the world and his company today is you know, running the world. So it was a really great group and that's what kind of got us launched. In fact, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits was the curriculum that I developed for that program, finally put in book form in 2002. So it was all about, all about scaling. It was. Right? It was about getting to this Birthing size. giants. Yeah, birthing giants. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you really, I remember, made me realize early on that, if, you know, when after uh, all of us were reading Good to Great, and I know Jim Collins, maybe we can talk about Jim Collins in a bit, Good to yeah. Great, and all, his whole corpus of study that created the five yeah. books, is that it's all fine and dandy, but almost no one in a YPO setting is going to run a Fortune 50 company. You know, right. I'm not going to run Honeywell, and I don't care yeah. if I do. Yeah. Um, and it's not... You want better margins. Anyway. Yeah, I want better margins. Sure. And so... There's something about this idea of this small to middle-sized market, and uh, you have some insights about it that I think would be great for this group to hear. Yeah, I think what's interesting, so that the segment, 10 million to a billion, uh, is responsible for 92% of the job growth since the Great Recession, 92%. And actually, in the recession, small business churned and burned. You know, they, they, let, they hired as many people as they let go, so it was a net zero. Uh, the large companies let go of 4 million people, yet it was us that generated 2 million jobs that kept whatever semblance of economy going that we had. And so, look, it's missional for us. It's always been missional that it's this middle market that are the unsung heroes of our economies. And I'll, I'll just share a quick story. So, you know, Finland is, is having a rough time. You know, Nokia, they had all their eggs in one basket. And when Nokia failed, it literally threatened the entire lifestyle of that country. And so a young ex-McKinsey, a woman named Anu, came back to the country and said, look, I'm going to do my part. And she went out into the hinterlands and identified 200 scale-ups. Companies, by the way, their average size is about 43 million. Combined revenue of the 200 is about 13 billion. And she said, I'm going to get them together and I want to support them burn your tools, that kind of stuff. We have a simple goal. In five years, we're going to double their revenue from $13 billion to $25 billion. And then last year, she hosted a conference with about 800, including the prime minister. And he came in and said, look, we're done. If we can take that segment from $13 billion to $25 billion, we have solved the economic problems in Finland. And we know that's the case in every city and every country on the planet. And without economic freedom, you can't ultimately have all the other freedoms that people ex expect. And as you and I were talking about, I was in a YPO meeting where I heard one of the top, several of the top military leaders say, that's always been our preferred first weapon is to both have a strong US economy and, a strong, and create a strong economy wherever we want to. Because strong economies don't fight. And that's why I think it's important in the, in the modern area. So it's an important segment. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the key segment. I know when... Uh, well, we and also they drive most of the innovation. And one of your insights that's been, I found very interesting is, is very often, and, and I know there's this, I guess, fascination right now with yeah. the, you know, the two guys in the dorm room who build an app and it just goes through the roof, is that that is not actually typically who run these companies. That's right, exactly. Yeah, the, the media is, you know, a little excited about the techies in their 20s, but it's the foodies in their 40s and 50s <laughs> that are the ones powering. Uh, foodies in the 40s and 50s. That's, a, that's our, our new throwaway line. Oh, interesting. Uh, well, in fact, you know who gave it to him was, e was Elon Musk's brother. Kimball. Kimble. Yeah, Kimball. Uh, we hosted him for an event, and he got up and he said, look, food's the new internet. 
And that got our attention. And they laid out the fact that if you combine the revenue of all the internet companies on the planet, and I wrote it up in my fortune column recently, so I had to like fact check it 27 times. Uh, it's only half a trillion dollars. 300 billion in the US, 200 billion in the rest of the world. Food industry is five trillion, it's 10X. So we're doing a big conference with Kimball at Harvard to really begin to highlight that this is the space uh, that's the future. Food, food's the future, man. Interesting how Amazon bought Whole Foods, huh? Interesting. <laughs> not and the market not by just accident. paid it and just gave it to them. Yeah, not by accident. Yeah, not by accident. decision. Yeah, interesting. So let's come back to the habits. So yeah, a little bit. Sure. Um, if there's a, um, and this plays a little bit into our, I think, both challenge and opportunity yeah. in YPO. Um, if there's anything that, that YPO loves to do is, uh, and I, I love YPO, it's changed my life in every dimension. Yeah, I, I don't hide that from anyone. Um, but yet it can often, it, it tends to be a very additive organization. We get a lot of committed champions who love to add things. And sometimes it becomes difficult to prioritize yeah. uh, the, the top things. But at the core of the habits, you started with that idea that, you know, leaders, leaders set the pace, right? And the companies that want to scale have to have a faster pulse and the walking and talking, the huddles. Yeah. Um, but prioritization and even forced prioritization is core to your belief in the most successful businesses, right? Yeah. yeah. And it was, it was Tom Meredith who was the first adult at, that the board brought in to help Michael Dell. I've known Michael since his second year in business, you know, and he scaled that thing to a billion in seven years. But then he, he was broke and the board fired everyone but Michael and brought in Tom, who was 15 years a senior, who I talked quite a bit about in both books. And Tom's the one who set Michael down and said, look, you've got to pick one thing every 90 days, not five, not three, one. And you've got to pick one then for the year. And then you've got to pick one for the next three to five years. And then you have the big, hairy, audacious goal that takes you out 10 to 25 years. And that's the critical decision. That's where you get paid the big bucks. Mm -hmm. And the whole world could say, we think it's this. And you can say, I hear you, but that's the hill we're taking. That's why it was important. But the, th the thing I wanted to, if, if I had a message, uh, Nikhil, this morning, you know, because I've been informed for all these years as well. Um, do you mind if I have them do a quick exercise? No, please. Um, why, what is it about forum that makes it effective? Anyone? Okay, and what, what is it about the structure? What does the structure f create? Yes, but Trust what creates that? Okay. Yes. All right. <laughs> fixed, fixed format, fixed, fixed time, time, fixed place. What else? Well, I'm going to go right to Greg. Greg, you nailed it. What's interesting, and, and part of my message is I, I, I find that when we do committee work, that if we would just bring what we've learned about forum, into that work, it would be tremendously more impactful and effective. We're even suggesting that if you look, consider that all work in the future is project work, that what the Navy SEALs, and I think it's interesting, there's more books written by now, Navy SEALs. In fact, the governor of Missouri is a Navy SEAL who's become one of the hot shot, probably expected to be in line for president uh, guys. What the Navy SEALs learn is that the ideal team size is five. It's not eight, interestingly enough. And that's why it's that size. And the military, because it's life and death, really had to figure out how to restructure their organization because we were getting a lot of men and women killed because of this hierarchical approach that we were taking to the military. And General McChrystal's book, Team of Teams, to me is the book of the 21st century. I named it one of the top five business books in my fortune column. And so if you consider project work at the heart of everything we do, then you go visit Google. And Google understood that if they could figure out what makes for an effective team, that would be worth billions. And so they had a project called Project Aristotle that they ran for two years, and they discovered only two things determine team effectiveness. And number one was equal talk time. And what's interesting, by the structure of the way a forum is laid out with a timekeeper, 
you know if you didn't have that, what would happen? The extroverts, the two or three, and look, all this research has come out that the introverts have a lot to add in our companies and organizations, but we don't give them any time to what? Talk and to contribute. And so I want you to think about the importance of bringing that idea, first of all, back into your companies. Look, I'm sitting with an executive team yesterday, and I'm telling you, the CEO would not shut up. And just because of position, everyone deferred. And it's part of why when you leave and you're gone 85 or 90% of the time, <laughs> everyone else gets to talk. Yeah. Everyone else gets to contribute because you're yeah. out of the way. Whose confession is this anyway? I, no, I'm well, sorry, yes. <laughs> I'm gonna confess. <laughs> okay. When I moved 3,600 miles away from my headquarters to Barcelona, Spain, We've had the best eight years in our company's history, okay? So, you know, I'm guilty as charged. The same, I think, with your committee work. Um, and we'll be talking about this technology called Circles with one of the teams tomorrow. But Dan Hoffman, who said, I think the whole world ought to be put in forums. We learn better in circles than we do in rows. Um, I'm one of his investors and I'm on the board. And we just held our first board meeting and we use this technology. And the thing that struck me the most at the end of the 90 minute board meeting is that we all had equal talk time. And this is a very powerful board. We got the co-founder of MakerBot and all kinds of just really, that any one of us have enough ego and things to say, we could have dominated that, that board meeting. But his process made sure we had equal talk time. And that was powerful. The second thing that Project Aristotle discovered was average social connection. And what does that mean in a, in, in a practical sense? Pat Lanchoni at, at uh, Five Dysfunction of a Team, the first thing he does with the team is put them through a lifeline exercise. So my question is, has your committee shared your lifelines with each other as an opening bonding experience? Uh, at this two and a half day that we do for YPO, uh, the last one I just did, one of the teams said, Vern, I'm going to take that idea and rather than work on your stuff tonight, we're going to go do a lifeline exercise with our executive team. And, they, and they're already a team that's well bonded, a well performing company. They came out the next morning and said it was life changing in terms of the bonding. We know that if you're bonded, that's when you build the trust. And so I, was sit, I snuck into the forum room and you guys had done your Myers-Briggs, which is a very important thing to understand each other. You share your lifelines. You share that piece of good news personally and professionally at the beginning. That was all designed in order for us to connect as humans. And that's what Project Aristotle found at Google. Teams that have connected at a deeper level and have equal talk time were the only two factors that determined significant success on project teams. And so the conclusion, everything you've learned about Forum and what makes Forum great, I encourage you, I beg you to bring it back inside your company and bring it to your work on these committees here inside YPO. Awesome. Another core concept that you talk about is the power of and the importance of coaching. Why do the best leaders have coaches? Yeah. Well, in fact, what's interesting, so the, you know, the company we've been talking a lot about is this Bootsark out of the Netherlands. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, in this book called Reinventing Organizations. This, you know, nothing's more critical right now on the planet than healthcare, mainly because of the aging of the population. And it's an absolute economic disaster in the United States, you know. Uh, we spend twice what the rest of the world does and get half the outcomes. It's, it's a tragedy. Um, and so, real quick, the Dutch have an interesting approach. They know that nurses can handle 90% of the issues. And so they had a system where they assigned a nurse to a neighborhood to handle most of the issues. Problem is the government was running it and it got very bureaucratic and hierarchical. So a nurse had to report to a uh, area nurse who reported to a regional nurse who reported to a district nurse who reported then to vice president of nursing. And it was this, and the nurses didn't like it, the patients didn't like it, and it overran in cost. So this nurse leaves with three other nurses uh, 11 years ago and said, we're gonna do it a different way. Today, let's speed forward a decade later, 12,000 nurses. It's the fastest growing healthcare organization in the world. They've now come to the United States. They're in Minneapolis uh, to get started. 
and there is no middle management. The nurses are put in teams of five, sound familiar? Now those five deal with the neighborhood, they support each other like a SEAL team, and there's only 28 people at headquarters, that's it. Now the only other thing that exists are about 100 coaches. Uh, my big prediction last year was I hope that was the year that we got rid of the term manager. I hope that that word leaves your lexicon inside your company and your organizations. Nobody, particularly millennials and the Gen Z, want to be managed anymore. And what's replaced management? That, right? That's what manages us. But what humans need is coached. You wouldn't think to have a sports team without a coach. And those of us that are in forums, man, whenever we bring in a forum coach, somebody to come in and tune us up, it really is a powerful process. And so what the Bootsar 100 coaches do is they move around and they work with those teams of five to help them become deeper connected, no one's dominating the conversation, we understand each other, and we can become more effective as a team. And so that's our rule. Management's replaced by coaching. You can have a much greater span of control, 30 to one instead of seven to one. Uh, and that's much more appealing to the new generations moving forward. Awesome. So awesome. There's something about the accountability factor in it too. When you, yes. as, a, as a CEO, as a leader, that you yeah. invite or hire a coach in to kick your butt. That's right. Right? Yeah, mean, anyone who works that. out, anyone who works out knows you, you do go further faster if you have a coach, uh, trainer, than if you don't. So what should, uh, you know, you, you, you know, the core part of your business is a coaching organization. Yeah. Like, what, uh, what should we be thinking about when we uh, seek a coach? You know, what are we looking for? Um, just get one. <laughs> um, and, you know, you're going to have to have culture fit. You want to make sure, you know. Uh, I, think the, I think the most important thing to do is read Pat Lanchoni's book about the kind of naked advisor. And you want that person who's willing to fall on their sword and risk their coaching position with you uh, in order to tell you the truth. Uh, and it's hard, you can't see it yourself. An outsider has to do it. And you absolutely should not facilitate your own strategy sessions because you've got to decide whether you want to be a part of it or facilitate it. You can't do both. And that's why it's, it's critical to have that, that role. I had this coach who was, um, after you recommended it a number yeah. of years ago, I've worked with a few coaches. And I remember, you know, after, you know, this observing a strategy session yeah. and a number of my senior team meetings and, um, you know, boy, Nikhil, this company's running so well and you're growing so fast and you've yeah. got, got the highest NPS in the industry and all this sort of thing. But he said, I just have a personal question for it, for you. How do you receive feedback? Mm. And I knew it was the punch in the face um, right at the moment, right then, because I, I really wasn't receiving feedback as well as I needed to. And it was that one moment that I opened myself up to further coaching, and it's been uh, very powerful. Yeah. You know, I'm reading a book right now, uh, reading several, but there's a book, <laughs> Judith Glazier's book, The Intelligent Conversation. Um, and it's, a, it's an IQ. And, and look, I'm guilty as charged. You know, the, all, the only thing you have to learn about a teacher is they teach what they need to learn the most. So whenever you hear any speaker at your YPO events, if they're standing up talking about something, it's because they need it the most. And I'm there. You know, I've blown a lot of relationships because I wasn't intelligent in my conversation, in how I express something. And that's this goes along with this, can you take the feedback? Right. Uh, and, and she admits in the book, as a coach early on, she didn't know how to provide the feedback in a way that would be receptive. So that's why we don't have any newbies. Our average coach is 53 years old. You know, they've been out there and around the, the track a few I mean, times. you've been around the world, you've, you've been yeah. involved with or advised or coached or met a lot of amazing people. Is that that Seeking feedback is probably a key component to the best leaders. It right? is. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, you have to be open to it, no matter what. Um, so you rocked my world. Um, I mentioned it earlier with this uh, this idea of could I be a better CEO on a significantly uh, 
smaller percentage of time available due to being yeah. chairman of YPO for a year. Um, and uh, so uh, Vern does these really cool things. That they're kind of a CEO boot camp, kind of go back and get your muscles built back up to uh, be a CEO. And uh, it was a fun group in uh, Florida. And you asked me a question, and I'm like, I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to be great at this. So, so what are your KPIs, Mikhail? So in the same way that Vern likes to talk about the best businesses have quick pulse habits, focus areas that you can name what your number one is, is he'll often talk about uh, this idea of KPI, key performance indicator. And you, you know, in a day, I mean, my business is all about data, and my, I have all these data people, and they love to measure everything. So we just, yeah. there, it's so hard to force people to focus on one thing sometimes, yeah. or to get that it KPI. Is. But it you is. ask the question, no, what are your KPIs? And of course, I kind of looked and I thought, and I gave you this kind of wonky, corporate-y, you know, we're going to grow this fast, and we're going to yeah. do this, and maintain our net promoter score above 80. And he said, no, th those, are, those are your business KPIs. What are your KPIs as a leader? Yeah. And I did not, candidly, have a good answer. Um, I, in fact, I couldn't say what I knew my personal KPIs were. And you, you changed my view of that one thing. He said, well, I, I mean, as a CEO, what maybe a KPI you should be thinking about is reduce your time to manage the company by 80%. Mm -hmm. That actually one of the jobs of a leader should be to actively be <laughs> reducing your time to manage the company. Correct. So I'm like, okay, so I wrote that down. And then you gave me the other one, which is, how about percentage of A players in the right seats? I'm like, whoa. And then it was, how many of the top people in your industry do you need to know and what percentage of them do you know? I mean, he kind of like rattles a few of these off and I'm just stunned silent. Like, and then you said, those are a leader's KPIs. Yeah. Those CEOs. types of, of CEOs, yeah. KPIs. Those are the types of things. So what are your leader KPIs? Yeah, yeah, it was fun. Last, so last summer, I decided to do the, well, my, I dedicate one of my fortune columns to this, this notion, because I'm, I'm a big Moneyball fan. Are you guys a big Moneyball fan? I, I love the fact that you, know, you have this industry that looked at all of these KPIs, and most of them didn't correlate to performance. And you know that CEO boot camp I host with John Ratliff, yep. you know, white yeah. PR. And, and John found the same thing in the call center industry. He, he rolled up 24 call centers, took his profit from 4% to 21%, bought him at three times EBITDA and sold him at 14 times EBITDA. Do the math and you end up with a private plane uh, like, <laughs> like Wei Chen. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Wei's a good friend with John as well. And the thing that struck John one night is he had all these metrics. And in fact, the industry had all these metrics. And in fact, you would win awards for achieving certain metrics. But none of them correlated to any kind of thing you would call success in the company. And that's when he had his money ball uh, moment and discovered the one metric that he needed to focus on that then powered all of this huge success in what I consider the sweatshops of the information age, call centers. <laughs> you know, if you can do it in call centers, you can kind of do it for any industry. And so I began to consider the same thing about the CEO. And so I created these five, and that's what we went through in the boot camp, and I take the CEOs through that. And, and where I thought it might be applicable to you is the first one that, that uh, McKeel referenced is if you're going to be in a committee and you want to make a difference, and if you want to make any difference, the first thing you have to do is take a piece of paper out. And this was taught by Regis McKenna to Steve Jobs. You know, uh, the key to drive anything's marketing. And the guru of marketing was Regis McKenna. He taught Steve Jobs and Intel and Genentech. And there was this young kid who wanted to build a young entrepreneurs organization who happened to cold call Regis back in 1985 and said, look, Regis, if you're good enough for Steve, you're good enough for me. He still kids me. I was his only free client he's ever had in the history of his work in Silicon Valley. He said, all right, I'm going to put you through the same process I'm putting Steve. And he said, shipped me out this book. I wish, I wish I still had it. It was a manual this thick. And he said, lesson number one. And Steve did this the rest of his life. Whenever you're faced with anything, you take a piece of paper out and you have to write down who are the 25 influencers that you absolutely have to get on board 
if you want to move this initiative forward. So when Steve went to launch iTunes, he knew nobody in the music industry. But we just had him, t- all right, Steve, take a piece of paper out and let's write down the names of the top 25 power players in the music industry. Steve did no one. And you would think with his, you know, he could get to anybody, he couldn't any more than some of us can. But he knew Don Henley, the drummer for the Eagles. So he calls Don up. He said, Don, come over, we're going to walk and talk. Teach me about why people don't like, you know, why musicians don't like the way music's handled in the industry. And then he goes, Don, you know anybody on the list? Don says, I know that guy. And Steve began to network his way through that list. And that's why he alone was able to pull together iTunes, uh, a guy that manufactures and designs hardware. And so, and then of course, crush them all out of existence, but yeah, that's a different problem. That's so <laughs> the, <laughs> the same thing we all want to do, right? <laughs> yes. In this room. And so to me, that's the most important thing is first for you to say, there are informal leaders in your own organization, within your own industry, influencers, and within the projects that you're trying to move the needle on. And to me, the most important thing is for you to take that piece of paper out and make that list and start working it. Uh, we've done the same thing with our new Scale Up You initiative. I've made the list. I knew I had to get Brad Feld. If Brad Feld signs on, the whole rest of the world in this space will sign on after him. And, and so that's number one. And that's what I would consider if you look at our people, strategy, execution, and cash framework, that's the most important people decision, I think we all as leaders must make if we want to make a difference. I think that'd be powerful for this group to be thinking about because very often we sort of sit in our committee structures and think about, well, we just have to do this thing instead of, okay, who do we actually have to move or who do we have to influence to actually make this happen? And personally And and outsiders. And what, what are the experts that we ought to invite in to get behind this? And what, what, where's the power, where's the influence in whatever it is we're trying to accomplish? Where does it exist? And what's, like, so I'll, t- I'll tell you, so when I went to launch, I said, uh, YEO, Ace and YEO, I, the first name I put on that list was President Ronald Reagan. I said, look, I'm this kid at Wichita State, but what the hell? You know, I'm, I put him down. And I said, I'm going to have him be the first president in the world, in the U.S., who utters the word entrepreneur. No president before that had ever even could say the word. Uh, we won't talk about present company included, but um, he, we did then. And when we launched the event with Steve Jobs, where we hosted his first party after being fired from Apple, uh, the president agreed to fly out and do the opening uh, welcome uh, for that. Really? I then wrote down Steve Jobs. I put Michael Dell. I remember, look, I've got to get Inc. Magazine and Venture Magazine on board. I don't know who owns them. Later, Bernie Goldhurst became one of my dearest friends. Arthur Lipper, who owned Venture Magazine, is still a mentor of mine 30-some years later. So the bigger the names you put on the list, the further, faster. And we were scaled in 36 months. We were global in 36 months because of that, that list. And that was Regis McKenna teaching me it and then spending an hour every week figuring out how to work that list. To me, that's the most important thing a CEO must do. Awesome. Make the list and work it. Awesome. Well, um, in a few minutes, I want to open this up to some, some questions. We've okay. been talking here for a little while. Um, and, you know, YPL members don't love to be uh, talked to for too long without uh, inserting themselves into the conversation, exactly. as, and that's okay. Well, um, what, what if we do this? Because well, I, I like everyone I do to have, work a little bit. Yeah, well, Take great. a moment right now. Start the list for your company. Just start it right now. Yeah. Five, Who five are the five, five, first five of the 25, if not 250 names? By the way, Bill Gates considered it the best question he had ever been asked. And when he wrote his list, he said, why didn't I have the U- European Union officials on that list? When I was flying over, I should have stopped in and had a coffee or two because most of his headaches were with that group that he had spent no time building relationships with. Start the list. Who are the top five influencers right now you need to get behind your company if you want to double its size in the next three to five years? Go. Take a moment. Awesome. Perfecto.
my observation of doing this exercise is some of the names should scare you. Like you said, imagine yeah. writing down Ronald Reagan. Yeah. That's... And by the way, I was then invited in when, when Bush was made president, uh, became president, I was invited in by, by George and Dan Quayle to come in, there were 10 of us, to advise them then on what was going to be their entrepreneurial policy in their term moving forward as a result of that, that work with the president. All right, so I, I encourage you all to build that list out. If that's the number one thing that we can all do, yeah. we should also be thinking about it in our YPO work because whatever you come out with in your committees, there are people that you need to get on board. And uh, it's you have to do it. There's no hidden mechanism that will get people on board with things that you're working on. It's and, a very powerful. And tool. the other thing I want to remind YPOers, you know, they talk about six degrees of freedom. You as YPOers are one degree of freedom from any human being on the planet. And I've been amazed that you really don't use that network as much as you should. Uh, I was sitting with one of our clients, a YPOer, and he's wrestling with something and I'm like, look, who do you know? Who, who are the people? He made the list. Then I said, get the directory out. And three of them were in YPO. And so that's why this organization is so unbelievably powerful. So before we open up the questions, um, obviously you read voraciously and I strongly recommend every, anybody just check in with his column that he does in Fortune Magazine about the best business books. I, uh, well, it, You've created my, what you named the guilt pile, yeah, right? Exactly. So, I mean, tower I, everybody of guilt. Know, I know, so yeah, it's the tower of guilt that, yeah. Yeah, that sits in my office and I, you know, you figure out what to, and I must be Amazon's, one of their greatest customers because what I first do is order the physical book and then yeah. I end up downloading it on my Kindle because I'm traveling so much. So they get me two times. And by the way, I hope you guys take advantage of it. Yeah. You have this uh, deal with Get Abstracts. And Get Abstracts, okay. you know, she's done an amazing job. They are the best abstracts of books of any of the abstract companies in the world. And that's a YPO benefit that I'm not sure enough YPOers are taking advantage of. I won't, I won't bore everybody. I mean, I read a lot of books, too, of, of all sorts. But um, I ta I've taken advantage of the Get Abstracts thing for years. Yeah. One of my tricks to absorbing, I, I believe, um, a concept that... But again, sort of started with uh, Vern is, is that if you can learn faster, you can kind of beat anything. Um, but I realized that I could absorb more if I could take in a set of concepts through sort of multiple senses. So I actually am a fan of not only reading books, but either listening to them as well when I work out. But I also listen to pod podcasts of the authors talking about why they wrote the books um, is a great way to reinforce learning faster. My trick is that I listen to it just on my, on my iPhone using the podcast app. I, there, usually any time a major book launches, the part of the book tour is the author will give four or five interviews. And, you know, the more, um, the better the interviewer, the higher the book sales are. But I listen to it on, if I'm exercising, I listen to it on 1.5 speed, so it's a little bit faster. And I can still take it in um, even when I'm exercising. If I'm sitting on an airplane, I can and they actually focused on it, I can listen to it at double speed, but my brain doesn't work yeah. much better than that. So you read the book, you do the Get Abstract, you listen to the podcast, it's just a deeper understanding of the book very fast. Um, and it's, a, it's my little learning hack that I'll share with everybody. But yeah. speaking of books, um, you are always <laughs> recommending them, but my, my question to you before we open up to, to uh, the audience is, um, what book right now would you give the most as a gift to somebody that you, I mean, you, you're always giving out books, but like, what's your number one gift, gifted book? Sam Zell's book. Hmm. You know, Sam's the multi-billionaire out of Chicago. I, every year I think there's this business biography that is just a must read. Hmm. Last year it was Phil Knight's book on how he built Nike. Um, yeah, the year before that, it was the guys at the container store called Uncontainable. This year, it is Sam Zell's book. And we're very excited. We're hosting him at our upcoming summit. This thing is brilliant. Stupidest title. I can't even remember it. That's how bad the title is. Um, but just get to Amazon and go Sam Zell. And he really lays out what he's done to, to achieve what he has in Chicago. 
All right, another one to add. To and the that. other one, I, the other one I want to emphasize. I have a, I, I'm on a personal mission, and I've shared this with Jim Collins, who's a, a dear friend. His book, Great by Choice. How many of you've read Great by Choice? See, not enough of you. Everyone's in the built to last, good to great, but those are all written about the Fortune 50. Great by Choice, his last business book, is by far, by a factor of 10, his best book he's ever written. I think because Circuit City and a few of those ones he featured earlier failed, it damaged his brand, and so a lot of you turned him off. But his Great by Choice and his chapter on return on luck, I probably have made more money off that chapter than any other chapter I've read in a book. And so, and, and he wrote that book about us, mid-market scale-up growth companies, and that's why it's particularly insightful. Awesome. I see a lot of notes being taken, so uh, that's a good thing. Um, my, my guilt pile gets, uh, the tower yeah. of guilt, the pile of guilt increases. Yeah, All sure. right, so um, we have a, a little bit more time left. Um, I hope you're finding this interesting. Yes, nodding heads, do I hear nodding heads? You're uh, hopefully getting from this. Um, Let's have some questions for Vern. Elon Musk. Yes. What's your reaction? Tell us something about uh, what we've been talking about today that might be uh, relevant Customer funded. You know, there's, <laughs> so literally last night, so I had a guy come to me last night and wanted to meet. He's got an unbelievable business concept. He's got it piloted here in Barcelona and he now wants to raise money. And I'm like, I don't understand why anyone would ever go out and waste one minute of their life trying to raise money. It's, you're just brain dead. And he's, he's already given 25% of the company away. He's going to give another 20% away with this next round. And where the Atlassian boys, when they went public at $4.2 billion, still own 70% of the company. And so John Mullins, who's run the LBS program for YPO for all these years and has been a uh, very close friend, wrote to me the definitive book called The Customer Funded Business. And that's what Elon's always done. And so if you look at the need to build a $4 billion factory, um, the fact that you got 400,000 customers to put down a $1,000 deposit, that was a $4 billion interest-free, equity-free financing for the, the company. That's brilliant. And that's what I think is impressive with Elon, is how he's actually funded all of this. Because um, you, you have to pay attention to that. We all have to marvel at the aura that he's created. Talk a little bit about how he's done that in your mind. Yeah. 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 I have, you know what, I, I've made it a rule, is I only talk about people I know, I've met, like Steve Jobs and Michael Dell. Anyone that I ever talk about, it's because I've met them. Um, I've never met Elon, and so I don't know. But I, I do know one thing. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what this means, but when, who was the actor that played Mark Zuckerberg in the movie? Jesse, what's his name, Eichen? Yeah, Eisenberg. Jesse said the most difficult thing for him to master was the stare. There's this look. I've only seen it five times in my life. Uh, Michael Dell has it, Steve Jobs has it, and I'm gonna guess um, Elon has it. It's, it's a, it's, it's a d depth of look that burns right through you and every wall that might possibly in the way, be in the way of whatever it is that needs to be accomplished. And, and it's, it's that look that mesmerizes people uh, when you meet him. And whatever's behind that is the magic. It's also Elon Musk. He invites people into a bigger story. It's amazing. What, if you haven't yeah. seen the TED talk, the interview that he did at this year's TED in Vancouver, and he's not, he actually hardly talks about Tesla at all. He talks about that boring company and whatever. And I think the yeah. company like went up some unbelievable amount of value. His yeah. ability to tell a bigger story and to invite people into it is just remarkable. It's absolutely remarkable. The other thing but I want to say about Elon Musk, and, I, and it comes back then to maybe a hint, again, on your project work in YPO. If you look at the execution piece then, the most important book ever written, the number one business book ever, is a book called The Goal by Eli Goldratt. By the way, there's going to be a visual version of it come out this fall. 
Uh, they, because I'm such a big fan of his, they let me kind of get an advanced look at it. And Eli's simple idea is the theory of constraints. That for you to spend any time except where the real constraint is, is a waste of your committee's time. Uh, and that's what I see happen on a lot of boards and committees and teams, is they're working on the fringes and not at, the, not at where the constraint is. So I want to come back to Elon Musk. You know, Elon's big in electric cars and solar, but he's not stupid. The Chinese are crushing everybody in solar, and you're not going to be beat Japan, Detroit, and Germany in electric cars. So what Elon has figured out is where's the constraint in both of those industries? It's always been the battery. And if he can be the intel inside every home and every car, dealing with what has been the constraint behind that industry unleashing, now you have control. And you have market share like Intel does, 87% of all devices on the planet. And that's why he's putting all this real bets there in Vegas in that battery plant. So that's the other thing that always impresses me with Elon. He goes, he identifies and goes to the constraint and controls it. And if you can control the constraint, you control the industry. Um, that's one of the things we've you know, worked on at the, the boot camp as well. Awesome. Next question. Somebody's got to have something. All right, everybody's writing. There are a couple of microphones out there. What, do we need coffee? Was it too late? Okay, oh, here. Shabir or Rick over there? Shabir. It's a great talk. Thank you very much, Ryan. You're welcome, Shabir. I think it was Socrates who gave long speeches and then his friends killed him. Is that right? I'm so it was a little hard to hear. Yeah, I missed it. Sorry, can you hear now? I can't. Okay. I think it was Socrates who gave long speeches and then his friends killed him. Oh. Is that right? Yes. So on that line, I, I was really intrigued by what you said about uh, talk time yeah. on the boards. Maybe you can give us a little bit more um, of your experience, especially all of us sit on committees and boards, and anything you can share on that, that will be helpful for us, please. Timekeeper. Just a timekeeper. I mean, I, I couldn't imagine being in my, a forum without a timekeeper. And people that are outside a forum can't imagine that a bunch of type A CEOs would put up with that. But my gosh, it wouldn't run. We can get two presentations done uh, because of the discipline of the timekeeper versus everyone just chatting. And that's what I think we have to bring. And that's what Dan's technology did on our distributed. Because the, part of the challenge is your committee meetings, you're distributed. You're not in the same town. And so how do you structure the phone call so that there's equal talk time? It seems so minor but it's at the essence of effectiveness. And that, that's, why it's, that's why it's important. And be careful if something tastes like hemlock when you drink it, right? That's, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Thank you. Um, By the way, bring timekeepers into your company's meetings. It's great. Seriously. You talk about constraint, talk time, everything seems extremely well planned and guided, but how do you do to foster innovation and creativity? Because yeah. with everything has been talked this morning, yeah. I don't think there is any space for the creativity and the innovation part we need in our companies or in our committees. Yeah, yeah. Well, two things. One, the Fortune 50 really lack creativity. My experience with mid-market companies, you got more than you can handle. Um, that's one. Number two, the best innovation follows a very precise process. And who's mastered is 3M. Uh, I, I was lucky I can talk about it because I used to lead the strategy sessions for the post-it note division at, at 3M. I got to know Art Fry who invented the post-it note. And then they moved me throughout 3M. And, and I featured him in my second book, The Greatest Business Decisions. It was 1950 that they made the decision to give every employee 15% on the job time to work on any innovation that they wanted to. Uh, an idea that Google stole 50 years later and upped it to 20%. But what I learned inside, and they introduce a thousand new products alone every year that are successful, is innovation follows a very precise discipline. And it's not a random set of 
activities. And so routine, which is our throwaway line, routine sets you free. And it's as critical for innovation and creativity as it is for running a tight operation in the organization. And we actually know the four steps of innovation, and if you follow it. And the, the leader is a guy named Doug Hall with the Eureka Ranch out of uh, Cincinnati, XP&G guy that helped drive innovation at Procter & Gamble. Uh, so that would be my, my short answer without getting into the precise components of what that process is. But 3M's How got it. So when, uh, oftentimes, business leaders, when they think yeah. of innovation, what, it's, it's more of a strategic conversation. Exactly. And I think at the, a hallmark of what you've learned and you kind of recommend yeah. to people is, is that we don't actually spend enough time or in a disciplined enough time in strategic conversations. So Correct. could you just, I mean, like, you don't have to go into it, but you know, maybe the council and the quarterly yeah. the sort of well, So two concept. things. So two things. One, I, I'm adamant that the first habit we all have to create is the council. Uh, when I asked Jim Collins of your 25 years of business research, what's the one idea you thought was the most important of all of them, particularly applicable to us mere mortals? And he said the council. That importance of having what is really structured like a forum group that meets every week for an hour. And it ironically is much more unstructured, but it's structured like a forum where you make a presentation, you get formal feedback, and that's actually how Fred Smith runs his executive team meeting that he has every Friday at Federal Express. And so that council is critical. And in Jim Collins, good to great, pages 113 to 115, that's where he lays out the 11 rules for how you form and structure uh, this council. And so I think that's, that's critical. Um, back on, so how do you get innovation at the committee work? Um, the most important thing we've actually learned, and I just had a big long conversation at lunch yesterday with a, a dear friend, and, and that is the wisdom of the crowd. And that's why you can't then do this work in isolation. What I, what I think is the second most important KPI for CEOs is being out of the office 80% of the week, talking to customers, talking to employees, shopping competitors, because our brain is just an operating system and nothing good can come out that wasn't put in first. And so Steve Jobs would, and Jonathan Ive would dig into what everyone else was doing and learn from them. And then out of that came the innovation. That was the preparation phase. Um, and I don't think we're doing enough of that. We're sitting in isolation in our ivory tower and just hoping that divine intervention strikes and that we're going to get the idea. But the real breakthroughs occur, as Sam Walton discovered, he would get in his car, I mean his pickup truck or his plane, and Monday through Thursday, he was out of the office, as were the executives at Walmart. And they only met on Friday to discuss what it is they learned when they were out in the field. Because the crowd is much wiser than any of us. And that's where I think the source of innovation comes. The most brutal part of the Rockefeller habits, when you, you, if you do it as hard as it is, is we had always been a company that planned annually. We did an annual yeah. strategy retreat for a couple of days, fairly traditional. And I, I remember it was one of the first things I remember you talking about. It's like, it's, that is wholly insufficient. If you yeah. actually want to be a growth company, you'll be planning fully two days out of the office, four times a year. You know, so you're, and you got to work on strategy every week, and you you're working work on strategy on every week. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit, you know, it's like the ten thousand hour thing. I mean, you you kind of get out of your company the hours that you put into it. So how, for one thing, how can you plan anything a year out, yeah. really, and adjust quickly enough? So this idea of actually doing eight days of strategy a year rather than two. It sounds awful, especially like your CFO just freaks out uh, because and because it's like full budgeting four times. You know, it's not just annual. They're like, well, can't we just check in quarterly? It's no, it's a, a real amount of dedicated time. And you just reminded me of a of an idea I wanted to share with the group. Um, and I just kicked my own counsels, but because we're not doing it ourselves. I think one of the best ideas I've heard from a CEO is from Jeff Bezos. And I think it really is applicable to your committee work. They, whenever they want to launch a new initiative, the first thing they do is they write its press release. 
And then, as the, as the team works on that project, they update the press release. That's the report. So that when it's now ready to launch, they have the press release that is going to be used to announce it. And so they'll start it when they, when they launch Amazon Smile. First, it was called something different in the initial press release, and it had different percentages, and it had, they were going to pick charities that they were going to give to. And you could see the progress of the team working on this significant innovation in the company by reading the subsequent series of press releases that they updated until they had it nailed, and that was the press release that they uh, sent out. So we're starting that uh, Monday at our next Monday call. <laughs> the press releases start on this, Monday. This weekend, I'm starting. The, I'm writing the press release for this big new initiative that we're doing, and then we'll continue to update it. Awesome, Debbie. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks so much for. I've got pages and pages of notes, and again, lots of books straight on the planes. <laughs> so here's my question for you. Yeah. Uh, most of us know in the organization that uh, between Rockefeller habits and scaling up, many of our chapters a good portion. Tom, I keep running into you, so. No, there's, there's a huge amount. And so yeah. the one thing I'm curious is a lot of us tend to have ADD. So the thing that we hear is, well, Vern came to our chapter two years ago, and we've done scaling up, and we did Rockefeller Habits. What's next? Yeah. So have you thought about that yet in terms of when they're asking for more Vern or the next scaling up? More yeah. Vern? What's oh, next? Oh, no. <laughs> well, we... Um, <laughs> That's scary. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, so I'm, I'm, we have five books in progress, but the key book is going to be called The Agile Scale-Up. We think you've got to move from the lean startup. There is a chasm that Jeffrey Moore described. What you did in the startup phase absolutely will fail when you scale. And so you've got to make the leap from a lean startup to an agile scale-up, which will include the innovations in, in organizational structure, which to me I think is the real revolution in this century. Um, as we go to this team of teams uh, kind of work. So stay tuned, we got a lot more coming out. The, the second thing, and I thought this is where you were going, um, it, it, it's so critical that YPOers find their Tim Cook uh, because you're ADD in all of this stuff, uh, particularly the entrepreneurial sector within YPO. And I mean, that's what helped Steve. You know, Steve could create it, but Tim Cook made sure that 10 million phones were in the stores when people were in line to show up. And making that hiring decision is literally the single most important decision that you'll ever make. That's the A player you've got to put. Now, what I've learned about that process is this is not a human being you can headhunt in. When they try to headhunt it, 80% of the time it fails. Howard Schultz has tried multiple times at Starbucks to headhunt this position in. Uh, Michael Dell failed miserably with Kevin Rollins and had to jump back in to that role inside Dell. And what I've learned is it's gotta be somebody that you've already spent significant time with. It's a former employee who left, made it, is gonna come back. It's a customer you've been dealing with that you can pull over to your side, supplier. Uh, somebody moved up inside the organization but then somebody said, all right, but the Google boys, they brought in Eric Schmidt. They headhunted him. And I thought, uh-oh, I've been nailed. So I went back and looked. And they were smart enough to put him on the board for a year. Uh, in a year in Google's like 10 years in any other company. They, they live like dog years. Um, so that they could test drive whether they could fight without killing each other and get along. So I've just, I've been courting a woman for two decades to come in and be our CEO. She's finally at that point, but she's still going to be an acting president for a set of projects for the next four months. And then in January, we'll, we'll decide to get married. Uh, but she's gonna be this key person, you know, for me, because I don't want to, I don't like to do, I don't like to do any of the stuff I teach, just so you guys know, <laughs> all right? I, I, this, is, this is why I teach, not do. But I know we have to do it. Uh, so I have to have the team in place that, that makes it happen. Thank you. That's actually exactly where I thought you were going to go, is on the people in the hiring side. That's right. You awesome. Got it. So one, one more question, and then uh, we'll, wrap up. we'll wrap up. 
if there is one more question. And then I have a, fi I have a final idea. Okay. Always. Okay. Was there one more? Okay, well, oh. Yeah. Or, Fascinating talk, and thank you. You're welcome. So, if you could uh, give us your top five. If you'd speak in the microphone, we're recording your, your, this. Your, so top, it's your top five uh, successful habits of uh, leaders that are learners. So, yeah. our characteristics, or at least my characteristics, are I don't uh, read yeah. consistently um, and focus. So, the way that I learn is different than academic uh, yeah. learnings, which is not traditional. So if you can give me your top five habits of successful learners and the leaders that you've uh, mentioned before. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the standard stuff. It's routine that sets you free, and it's measuring. What gets measured gets done. So it's Mark Zuckerberg who said, all right, I'm going to read a book every two weeks. And he held himself to that until that habit was developed. Bill Gates did it with his Think Weeks. Uh, he knew that nothing interesting can come out that didn't go in first, and so he would take an entire week, twice a year, and his record was 112 books, manuscripts, PhD thesis, white papers that he isolated himself and he just plowed through. Um, so whatever routine works for you, uh, whether it's during your workouts, with podcasts, you just have to build it into your schedule, and that's what's critical. The guy that really impressed me with this was, was uh, Mark Cuban. You know, this guy is running 100 and invested in 150 plus companies uh, and thinks he'll be the next president of the United States as well. But one of the things that I didn't, I've known Mark from the very beginning uh, when he has a little IT company in Dallas, but he's had a habit since age 20. He reads three hours a day. So again, I don't care if you read or learn or however you learn, but that is his number one habit. When he got married, he goes, honey, look, I know I got to give up my furniture you know, as most guys do. Um, but I'm not giving up this routine. He is in some kind of learning mode for three hours every day. And, and which ties back to something that John D. Rockefeller did. John worked it from home till noon every day. And the thing that I've seen is common among the most successful is they have an office away from the office. They have a space away from the office where they can get this quiet, alone time. Now he had, a, had the most leading edge telegraph system so he could be getting data in constantly from his Russian oil fields right there at his home. So he had leading edge technology to stay in contact, but he isolated himself for half the week uh, and only went in then for that lunch at noon and then started. Um, Steve Jobs did much the same thing. So find that space is critical. The, the last idea I wanna leave you with, and we're, we're uh, we, we may have one more question. Oh, but fine. Go ahead. Okay. So, so the, thank you very much. And the, the idea is we've read your books, and or yeah. some of us um, have read your books. What things have you written about? What things were you passionate about that well, we won't get mad that aren't going to work in the future? What what things were you were you writing about? Like which books shouldn't we read for the next ten years? We got millennials coming up. Um, what what do you think is changing so much? Things that you were passionate about that may not be working. 10 years from now. Well, you shouldn't read traction. I'm just kidding, all right. <laughs> Some of you will get the joke. Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. Hmm. You don't have to answer it. No. <laughs> God, I love great questions. Hmm. Maybe I'll have an answer by either the lunch committee meeting or There's tomorrow's some. committee meeting. I'll think about that. Well, we're also going to put this up on the source. And so, and I, I would recommend that maybe as part of the, the source heading, we'll list the books that have been here yeah. so that the rest of the members can see what, because you kind of, we kind of went fast. And yeah, if I you think give the Communist name, Manifesto. The Communist Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I tell a quick story on that? Sure. So I, so I, I was in the Reagan administration for a year then after engaging with, with uh, the president's team. And so I decided to take that year and study government. And I did a project at the Heritage Foundation uh, with Cato. And I wanted to understand communism. And we're, why, why did so much of the world, 
And you want to read the scariest book? I just finished the scariest book I've ever read called Brothers. Have any of you read Brothers? It's the true story, the biography of Alan and Foster Dulles. You know, Alan ran the CIA. Foster was our Secretary of State. And those two guys wrecked most of the havoc that we're dealing with around the planet. They created the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the mess in, in Iran. You know, let's just go down the list. You know, we are the instrument of our own messes. Um, and it was all driven by the fact that we were fighting communism. And there was this real red scare that you had even, you had even Hickok, referenced. Man. And so I wanted to understand where it came from. And I realized that it, it simply has to do with scale. Communism is critical for the family. You wouldn't think to run your family in any other way but communistically. What is the fundamental of communism? To each according to their needs, from each according to their abilities. I'm not going to ask my 10-year-old to go out and make it on his own, though a lot of kids his age have had to do that in other places on the planet. The problem, so we all want to be part of a bigger family, but communi communism doesn't scale beyond the family. So I wrote a paper called From Communism to Capitalism. Then you can have socialism, and socialism scales to about 50. And I spent too much time in Boulder, and we have communes and all that stuff. And, and it works at about 50, which is why it's a natural point. So about seven folks, a family, communism works. About 50, uh, socialism works. And then you have democracies, and they only scale to a certain size. And that's when our founding fathers had say, we got to get beyond democracy, and we have to create a representative government. And so it's a longer conversation. But that's why I flippantly threw out the Communist Manifesto because of the havoc it's wrecked around the planet. And it ties back to this importance of understanding that what, what, what got you here in your business will not get you there. And that's the hardest thing to learn uh, is what to let go of. And that's really the essence of your question as I think about it. And, and that's what you have to come to grips with within yourself. Uh, I'm not sure that there's a book you have to let go of. All right, so that's my... <laughs> All right, final thought. You want, to, you want to wrap up for us? I, I love great questions. And I, my, my latest thing I'm, I got a kick on is this Clayton Christensen question. What is the job that needs to get done? And if you haven't watched what I think is the best YouTube video ever, it's Clayton Christensen's YouTube video on what is the job of a milkshake? And he walks you through that. And until the company they were working with understood the job that that milkshake was really doing for the customer, could they really understand how to make it better and innovate with it? So I'm going to maintain to summarize with your committees. Number one, make the list. Who are the influencers inside YPO and outside that could inform us to really get whatever project we decide done well? and fast. Number two, what's the real job the YPO needs this initiative to accomplish for them? And there's a book called Jobs to be Done. We've got the author coming up in St. Louis in our summit. It's an outstanding book that really helps you think through that question for your company, but I think you have to think through that question for your committee work. And then when it comes to execution, equal talk time, and stay connected socially. Uh, then you can do deeper, better work as a result. And then, you know, figure out a way to fund it. Uh, <laughs> so there's your people, strategy, execution, and cash.